Welcome to Talk Tennis. Danielle Lau, you're always one of our favorite guests. So thanks for joining me again. Thank you. This is fun to always catch up. I love doing pods. I know. I feel like I just get to chat with my friends and um, we have a lot to talk about and you Mm -hmm. have been crushing it. Oh, first of all, like shout out because you always are the player that crushes the content in all the ways. (laughs) I'll like send emails out to people and be like, hey, it'd be so cool if you could do some content. And everyone's like, well, I'm not (laughs) (laughs) D-Lau. Like, okay, she's going to start teaching you guys a course. We're going to have you (laughs) teach a course. We can have a course, yes. And then, of course, we always love the puppy cameos. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have have a younger one in the house right now. The older one has moved out with my sister. But the younger one is, is, she's not she's cute she's lucky she's cute she's not as smart as riley um oh riley was a lot easier to 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 film with you just put a treat (laughs) and he'll stay still he's really good on his commands roxy the younger one's a little bit more uh for for looks and and (laughs) (laughs) how old is she when when we um when we adopted her she was about we are estimating a little bit under a year. She has this real like puppy energy, yeah, you know, this puppy vibe. Um, but she was a stray also, and I guess the the shelter uh, took her in, and her best friend was a Chihuahua, and they were <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And, yeah, so they were roaming the streets alone for I don't know how long, but yeah, so she kind of does have like stray um, mannerisms, right? Like yeah. Riley will come and she, he'll be a pal and he'll he'll sit in my room and hang out with me, but she'll she'll just come check in on me, but like make her round like a cat, and we'll <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll resume back to her bed, like back outside where she belongs. So oh, that's yeah. funny. Oh, so cute though. We love. I love it. At least the more dogs in the <laughs> that can get mixed in, the better. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's start. Where are you at right now? What's going on? What's what's new in the DLAO world? How's the mm-hmm. tennis? How's the running? Like, give me just a quick check in. Where are we at right now? Wow. It's so, October. Um, yeah, so I've taken a break from competing uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, I had um, I had a great opportunity to to help coach a little bit back at my alma mater at USC. Uh, our head coach Allison Swain was uh, going on maternity leave, so she needed a third coach. So um, so I went in to to fill in and and just um, you know, give back to give back to my program. I I tell a lot of people I swore that I would never ever coach <laughs> that I would just. As soon as I wanted to take some space away from the game, that I would almost be like left empty in my tennis tank and no way I was going to coach. But I actually really enjoyed being um, being out there with with the team um, and the girls. And it, it made me kind of fall in love with the process again, like a little bit of um, what I was missing a bit. Uh, because on you know being being on tour for 10 years it's sometimes it's very result driven especially when it's your career Uh, Mm -hmm. but from a coach's standpoint all you care about is the process and that's what I have always loved about about the game about like you know about the sport in general it's just the constant build and I think I lost sight of that quite a bit um, in my own career so um so yeah just being able, having the opportunity to coach, especially in a team setting, which I really was like fond of when I was at school. I, I, I do feel like we can have a few more like team events like in the tennis world. It would just be great for like cohesiveness and camaraderie. Mm-hmm. So I was just put in like an environment where I can love the sport like uh, in the most like organic way again. And like during that time, I, I, I know I, I do. Everyone knows I have an interest in running and so since I wasn't competing, I was like, have at it, Danielle, like put in the miles, <laughs> like, let's see, let's see where this can go. And um, funny enough, I was able to partner with uh, with Hoka because uh, my contact at Picky Bars um, had actually moved over to Hoka. And um, so we did a few projects together. And I'm still currently doing projects with them, creating content uh, for them. That's awesome. And uh, ran a half marathon in San Francisco, which was a great experience. Um, 
and and now uh, I guess that that kind of like led me to the the summer the summer months. And, and to about now, during the summer, I coached for um, the USTA a little bit. I, I worked with the top collegiate girls and um, coached them during some like professional events to help them, you know, just familiarize them with the transition, had a training block with them. Um, and uh, yeah, I got to know them. I was working with Mary Stoyana, uh, Fiona Crawley, Reese Brentmeyer. Chloe Beck, um, Maddie Sieg was on that team also, but she also had, um, you know, her private coach, Eric Cortland. So uh, I just helped out and filled the gaps in wh- wherever I could with her. But uh, it was a joy to like work with them. Um, that was actually my most, that that was my favorite uh, setup. Actually, That's because cool. they're intimate, four girls, like three to four girls. Um, and just playing, you know, playing tournaments on tour. I was, you know, that's very like close to like where I left off and I'm, and I was just still so close to like that, that part of the game. And I felt I had a lot to offer them like, um, in that transition, especially I have a passion for that transition as well, like coming from college and giving it a shot on the pro tour. And, um, from that, I had some like junior, junior coaching opportunities too. I've coached like intersectionals done some girls 12 and under camps and again I thought I would not coach under (laughs) I would not coach juniors that's not gonna happen but now I'm knee deep like I have a few um competitive juniors I'm working with um slowly kind of building a reputation as a coach and um you know, uh, as a, more as than a building, I get text messages from parents about how amazing you are. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, so, yeah, I'm just I'm just working with with a couple of juniors, uh, either some some a little bit more full time, some from a consulting standpoint, just to give them something fresh to take home, like to to them and their coaches. Like I, I do feel like I, I would love to be like supplemental in that way, kind of similar to how I was supplemental to the college girls over the summer mm-hmm. you know just like uh, have them spend a few weeks with me give them something new and then like they can go they can go back to their coaches with something a little bit fresh and they can continue the work and and yeah so so that's kind of where I am I'm I'm helping Pete Brown uh, the Pete Brown program a little bit right now doing a little yeah. coaches training there and um, nice. yeah otherwise just kind of building the reputation running Still hitting, still hitting tennis balls, and uh, yeah, just getting busy, yeah, bu- building a reputation. Like as a coach, haven't hung up the the competitive part yet, but as of right now, I kind of like where I am. Nice, mm-hmm. I love that, and <laughs> of course, I have so many questions to go mm-hmm. from there. But also myself, I actually coached before I moved to Tennis Warehouse, and I said never, never, ever, ever again. Never. Like a hard no, I will not coach Uh again. And I'm finding myself smack dab in the middle of a high school season. (laughs) But I'm absolutely Instagram post. That's awesome. It's it's been so fun. I'm like, we got ranked, uh, I guess I hadn't even been keeping track with the rankings. Um, we mm-hmm. were rank- we are ranked number one in our CIF section and Division Great. One. So yeah, let's go, ladies. Um, <laughs> but it's it's been all of the in between stuff. Like you said, it's not necessarily about like you get so hung up on wins and losses. But like mm-hmm. we did a huge charity match and we're celebrating our seniors this week. And I keep telling the girls like I'm not gonna be like any other coach that you've had. It's not gonna be like last year or the year before. But it's kind of it's it's been so cool to just like see them grow and like trust mm-hmm. and believe in themselves and each other. And I'm sure you're feeling all the same things with your players. Yeah, yeah. And and every player is different. Everyone has their own challenges and like the um and yeah, and, and certain things that they want from their game. And I and I love like the challenge of catering. Well, not catering, but like working with a player in like their own capacity and like where they are at in their career. And it it also takes me back to like, you know, my process, my journey. I was like, oh, I think I remember feeling like that. Right. Or like I remember when I was like 13 and then like <laughs> with the college girls, I remember when I was fresh on tour and like everything was very new. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just it, I, I guess it's a great way for me to reflect on my own career without like that judgment piece, just because I want to reflect on my own experience to help instead of um, 
it, it, well, I guess like to help someone else instead of like being a little self-absorbed about like, oh, I could have done that better or like, where did I falter and such. Yeah. So it, it's it's been great for me. It is such a selfless thing. And I find myself getting emotional when I'm like most proud of my team, which is uh-huh. kind of crazy. <laughs> uh-huh. I literally will just like start crying. And I'm just like, I don't know why I'm crying, but I'm just so <laughs> proud of them. <laughs> but I told, it's, it's definitely selfless. And mm-hmm. um, so let's ask you this. What kind of coach are you? Because you have a very calming personality. You're mm-hmm. not really like super, you're not always like the loudest one on the court. Like what kind of coach, what do you bring to the coach? dynamic so like what what I like to do is um I I kind of learned this from Paul Anacone a bit like when I I'm, I'm a very organized coach and I have and I have structure because okay. I think you need to learn the rules before you can break them um <laughs> but when it comes down to watching a player like I look at them and, ob- and observe them in like three different ways like their talent like you know they're mm-hmm. their physical skills their racket skills and such and then I define their weapons. I help them define their weapons. And then we go into like, okay, are you maximizing those weapons tactically? Are you maximizing them technically? And like, so we start there, like with the Mm -hmm. actual tennis. And as we build a relationship, then we start to get to know, um, you know, the head and and the heart a bit more. Mm -hmm. Like the head, like, can you find clarity in pressure situations? Like, do you know what the type of player you want to be when it's five on the third set? And I help them uh, manage that Mm -hmm. and, and find ways to allow themselves to be, to be that player that they want to be like in those tight situations. And uh, the last piece is, is the heart. And that's, and that's if they can compete no matter what. Yeah. Unconditionally, like rain, shine, dog died, dog ate homework, what not. Mom and dad, you know, got mad at you. Like, can you when it comes, you know, time to go, like, can you compete unconditionally no matter what? Yeah. And so so I, I normally assess a player in those three ways and see um, where they feel they're lacking or where they feel they're missing a few pieces. Where can I fill in the gaps? And and yeah. So um I, I go from there and then we, we, we build a relationship. And, but my philosophy is to allow a player to play, not to force them to do anything. It's so that they mm-hmm. can allow themselves to do what they've, what they've trained to do, what we've practiced to do, what we've prepared to do. Nice. I love that. And um, I don't know about you, but maybe you can speak a little to this because obviously you're still hitting a lot, not competing. Mm-hmm. But are you finding that tennis is coming more natural out of your body now that you're spending all this time coaching? Oh, yes, of course. Like now I was now I'm just thinking back on my career. And I'm just like, gosh, I did I really need to practice that much? (laughs) I know there'll be days. Yeah, Mm -hmm. there'll be days where like, wait, like, you know, just because you're always analyzing different Mm -hmm. ways or like seeing how a player is striking the ball or how like their patterns. And it's Mm -hmm. just I don't know, it comes out sometimes without even practicing it. (laughs) Yeah, no, for sure. I think like as a coach, because you are watching a lot of tennis from a non judgmental standpoint, um, you're you're you become very clear on what you're looking for. And, um, you know, the optimal or the max or the, the maximized like form of like what you're looking at. Like, so normally if I'm looking at a player, I'll see like what they currently have and I'll, and I'll just like try to fast forward a little bit. Okay. Like, what does that look like? Like maximize, like, or what does that look like? You know, if it's even more optimal. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I think that exercise in itself, um, helps me to be clear subconsciously on like what what I want like when I'm hitting when I'm playing yeah Uh, so yeah for sure um a lot of things are a lot more clear now from the coach's box right and like even with age I keep talking about this is like you have to literally like go through it to see it now the way you see it Mm -hmm. so like I don't know I'm I was gonna ask you if you have any players that have challenged you like Mm -hmm. mentally challenged you like oh this is not going to be an easy Mm -hmm. easy like easy one but like usually those ones that challenge you like you're like okay I get where they're coming from Uh and what about you have you had any challenging matchups or someone Um, that kind of pushed you (laughs) actually actually I don't know if 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 challenging in that way um 
I'll, I'll tell you how I'm the most challenged, like as a coach, actually. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe you could say like, what was that? If, if that was what you're asking or not, mm -hmm. I find that as a coach, like my biggest weakness is wanting it more than the player. I get that. <laughs> that is like my biggest challenge, but in terms of like where they're coming from, like why they, why they think a certain way, I quite honestly, I have thought it all. <laughs> <laughs> I have thought it all, or it's at least crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have thought it all. Yeah. And I And I've and I've done a lot of mental training in terms of like, you know, realizing that, you know, you're not your thoughts and such. So even though we a player and I may have completely different personalities and I I have probably thought what they've thought because I am a thinker. I'm an overthinker. <laughs> and and I'll just be and I just like chalk it up to, okay, well, we're have completely different personalities. I for sure have thought that, but then again, I am not my thoughts. Like that has definitely crossed my mind. And, and it's probably also because of how much tennis I've seen, how much I've done and for over how many, you know, for over how many years, how many plane rides I sat there by myself and I had to you know, just sit there with my own thoughts. Like it's definitely, I've definitely gone around the world and back and more. And so I haven't run across like something yet where I'm just like, huh, I've never thought of that yet, but I'm I'm sure like in, in due time, it, it will, it will happen. <laughs> no, I get, I totally get it. I, I referenced something similar. It's like you have all the tools in your tool, tool belt for like whatever situation you're like, I'm ready. Let's go. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Or, or maybe if I haven't thought it, I've heard somebody think, this, right. right? I've heard somebody voice this before and <laughs> explained it to me. So like in a lot of ways it's, and, and I, and I tell this to all my players that I work with, I was like, I hope you guys like can feel open with me. That I'm not judging you. I just want to help guide you and mm -hmm. trust me, whatever you're embarrassed about saying, I've probably heard it or thought it. <laughs> yeah, right. Experienced <laughs> it. And like just just tell me and we we find a solution or a way to manage it. Um, but with uh you not telling me, um, you're you're on your own. Like <laughs> <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> Totally. Oh, mm -hmm. gosh, I could go in so many directions. But I was going to ask you, you've had some amazing coaches work with you through your career, through juniors, through college. Talk to me about some of the most influential coaches you worked with. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, you know, I would I would have to say like at USC, Richard Galleon was really great, great to me. And I still talk to him like on a weekly basis. Uh, Cal Moranin, he was my childhood coach from the ages of like 15 until I was 25. Um, he was the guy that said, Danielle, do you want to turn pro? And I said, no, I don't have money. And he said like, and he said, well, um, would it help if, if you didn't have to pay for a coach? And then I was like, uh, yes, it would. And he's, and he said, okay, just pay me lunch. You don't have to pay me. Oh. But let's, let's give it a try. I was like, okay, Cal, thank you. Um, <laughs> so without him, I would not have been able to jumpstart, uh, my professional career. Uh, and, and the latest coach that I worked with Roger Smith, great, great influence on me. He really taught me like the high levels of like the game, and he's probably one of the biggest influences in terms of how I coach in terms of, you know, my structure and how to mm -hmm. do it in the most professional way. Um, let me think. I, I did work with Irina Falcone and Andy Gerst in, in between like Cal and, uh, and Roger, um, back in the earlier stages of my professional career. And those, those two were very, a very unique experience for me. Like they taught, they, the impact they have on me is like, how do I, how do I level with the player a little bit better? Um, mm -hmm. Not just coming from a coach's standpoint, like how do I have that like empathy, like for a player and build that relationship in that mm -hmm. way where I can shift from also like coach to a little bit like a friend or, or, um, maybe not even a friend or something close to a peer. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I definitely learned that from them. And so uh, bad on me, but sometimes I, I leave those two out <laughs> when, <laughs> when I'm talking about coaches because the other ones have just uh, been like such a solid 
presence in my life, like constantly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those, but those two for sure have like helped me to be a better coach uh, right now as well. Nice. And where are you looking right now, aside from everyone that you mentioned, to kind of motivate you and keep you like learn new things? I mean, mm-hmm. I know like Deion Sanders has been viral this football season and I'm uh-huh. tuning in to see what he's doing every week. So who are you watching and who are you learning from? Yeah. So like for for me, I always love listening to podcasts. I love mm-hmm. listening to Finding Mastery by Michael Gervais. Um, I, I do also learn from just talking to other coaches, honestly, Mm -hmm. uh, when I go to these, you know, 12 and under camps or, um, you know, coaching intersectionals, just coming across anyone, um, it's nice to, to talk to them as a coach, um, and pick their brains as coaches Versus before when I may have interacted with them, I was coming from a player standpoint. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- it's been great to learn from other coaches. And what I've found that I love, like I've really enjoyed doing is especially like at a camp, standing on the side with a coach, talking about a player, watching the same player at the same time. Mm-hmm. And and it's not even um, seeing if they see something different than me. It's mm-hmm. more or less like, We'll probably see the same thing, but I'm just curious as to how they communicate it. Because I think yeah. communication is huge when it comes to connecting with your player. Um, being being clear and concise is is one of my goals. Because as a as a player myself, maybe there was uh, maybe I took on too much information. I didn't know how to um, how to simplify it uh, because. Things put simply is a lot better in competition too. So like that's my greatest challenge, like to have great information, but to be clear and simple, but but not leave anything out at the same time. Like trying mm-hmm. to do a trying to do a, a, write a great tweet. Like that's tough. Like <laughs> 140 characters. Well, now I think they've expanded it, so it's not even a tweet anymore. <laughs> like, but that's a that's that's the challenge, and that that's the thing that I'm always trying to improve to be clear and concise. Nice. And Mm -hmm. I have to bring this up, too, because I see it and I'm sure you see it. But the importance of being a female coach, there's not I would say we're in the minority and it's nice for our Mm -hmm. up and coming women to have role models to look to. And maybe sometimes women communicate things a little bit differently than their male counterparts. So talk to me a little bit about being a female coach for female players. It's it's been great, I do think. our sport is looking for for more strong females to to slip into those roles. Um, honestly, I thought I would have a little bit of a tough time. Actually, like um, I I definitely I have a a different presence than the than the traditional tennis coach. I'm mm-hmm. five three and male, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so it, it's been it's been a challenge for me but for sure it's it's motivating like I wake up every day and I've always woken up every day like this like whether I was a player or a, a student or whatnot I, I've always wanted to be just shot to be three times better mm-hmm. and um and I feel like that that goal it um it comes out in the energy and the way you present yourself too and I and I've and it's been great to to feel appreciated for that, actually. So so yeah, like it, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say I you can just tell like you hearing you speak about it, you're super passionate, and it's mm-hmm. obviously it's a good fit right now for you because you're you're very lit up and like excited, and I love mm-hmm. seeing you like that. So. Yeah, um, Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have one more coach question and then we'll talk about running. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Um, let's talk a little bit about being a coach that knows and understands gear and being able to coach a player with their mm-hmm. changing of gear, because I mm-hmm. personally think that might be more important than a lot of people realize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like I have, I have some players asking me, do you think I need to change this? Do you think I need to change this? And the first thing I, I look at is um, 
well, you could tell me I, I, I need help on this too. The first thing <laughs> I look at is like, is for a 13 year old, is their ball lacking anything when I hit with them? Like, is it lacking anything? If it's not lacking anything, we're not changing anything. Like, exactly. Don't, like, let, don't go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> right? It's fine. Yeah. If anything, if you want to feel a little bit more tidy, just restring that racket more often. That's it. <laughs> regrip that, regrip that racket more often. Let's not reinvent the wheel, please. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in terms of like um, you know making making progress during a, a training block and such, I do feel like as the players get stronger and older, they can experiment with a little lead tape, either at ten and two or nine and three, depending on how they um, you know how they hit the ball. But in terms mm-hmm. of racket switches, like I think sometimes when we're going on racket switches, like that's some something else, like <laughs> you know. <laughs> It's not the gear. Like, it's not the gear. What are you looking for? You can't find it. Yeah, what are you looking for? It's not at, it's not on Tennis Warehouse right now. It's somewhere upstairs. I'm just kidding. (laughs) No, you're, I bet you're, it's true. Like, Mm -hmm. like, I mean, Mm -hmm. um, I get it. Yeah. And also, I think another thing that I look at and maybe, by all means, I'm not, I'm not using this like professionally or what, but professionally or whatnot but it it's a it's something I do consider I always watch if a player is like a target hitter or an area hitter okay right and and so target hitters normally play with a thinner beam area hitters play with a little thicker beam like that's (laughs) about it like that's as far as I take it but if you're talking about like oh it's this many grams and this many specs and whatnot I the it's (laughs) plain and simple to me is your ball lacking anything? No? Okay. Like, <laughs> is your shoulder hurting? Yeah. No? Okay. Then what are you what are you fishing for? <laughs> right? I, I yeah, I think that's funny. Um, it's so, true. so give me advice here as a coach. Like, well, no, what else I'm also curious. Uh-huh. I'm also curious though, like, there's a big education right now for me, at least with the high school girls. A lot of them will play like restring rackets because they're like, oh, my coach gave me this to restring with. And I'm like, do you know why you're using it? Like, And I've had players, we've switched them from hybrid to full polys, full beta Mm -hmm. polys. And then I've had players (laughs) that need to switch out of multifilament to a poly Mm -hmm. just for a little bit more control. But Mm -hmm. um, they don't know. And then even like educating them on overgrips. Like, yes, you can replace that once a week. It's going to be okay. <laughs> like that. And like taking ownership of their gear and like being proud to like rewrap their overgrip. And maybe that's going to be something that's um, calming before a match kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But that's, yeah. that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I guess the, as far as I will take like the gear too, is maybe even the shoes. But oh, I'm yeah. kind of more like from a running standpoint. I think everyone's got their own like quirks in terms of like what they're looking for in a tennis shoe, how heavy and whatnot. I don't know if I'm in a place to advise for that because there's so many dynamics in tennis. Like there's the lateral movement, like what type of mover are you and such. So I just leave that up to the feel of the player. Like, are you getting blisters? Are you getting toe jam? Okay, then we can visit it. But if not, you are fine. Um but from a running standpoint, I could talk about that. Like, okay, let's talk about uh, let's go. Let's talk about running shoes. Let's talk about running. Um, let's start with the first question. What does running offer you that tennis doesn't? Oof, I think I really love the running community. Actually, I love that vibe. You win, I win. We finish this workout, <laughs> we win. Not that you can't get that in tennis, but it's definitely uh, a little bit m- more natural and forthcoming in the running world. Um, I love how people can be very casual. Um, mm-hmm. There's a and a lot of different levels of runners can come together for an mm-hmm. event and and just run. You guys, I I feel like in tennis we need to match levels a yeah. bit too much. Like yeah, if you're if you're a ten UTR, you can, it's tough for you to play with a six UTR. But like for a run, like if I'm going going for a slow run. I can go run with a friend that maybe does not, you know, cannot keep, cannot hold my threshold pace, but that's fine. I just, I just operate like on a different type of workout and it's still fun and it's still enjoyable and it's still productive. So I think there's a lot more opportunities to just to get together with all types of levels of runners. 
And, yeah. and especially if you do track workouts too, like anyone's invited. <laughs> yeah. You know, you and mean, that's make the make around. Everybody's there within within that like 400 meters. And it's just nice to be there with somebody else. So there's a lot of creative ways to be inclusive. And I and I just love that about the running community. That's really cool. And um, you'd mentioned track workouts. I think track workouts totally correlate to tennis and mm-hmm. performance. Um, but let's let's hear you kind of pitch to the tennis player out there that like is like, oh, my knees are bad. I can't run. I'm not running. I'm too old for this. Um, <laughs> give them like something to be like, OK, maybe I'll try running one more time. You need to get the right shoes. <laughs> I think that's so big. OK, and let's we'll just talk. Sh- I want to know your training plan right now because you've already mentioned how organized you are. And I know uh-huh. you're not just like seamlessly like, oh, today I'll run four miles I know you have a plan uh-huh. and I know you uh-huh. go out on these like training runs and you're like oh I didn't even mean to go that fast <laughs> <laughs> I'm like gosh darn it Danielle stop uh-huh. being so athletic okay uh-huh. so <laughs> let's okay. talk about the importance of the right shoes and did you mm-hmm. have to try out a bunch of different Hoka shoes before you got settled into your shoe of choice yeah so I wow like partnering with Hoka has been such a learning experience for me. Like before I got with them, I thought running shoes, running shoe, but then, um, I went to, to REI to try on like different shoes just, just before I, um, before I asked them for, for certain models. Right. And, Mm -hmm. and of course I did a little bit of homework and I was like, okay, so this is a mileage shoe and this is a speed shoe. And this is, this is more for walking. I was like, what's the difference? And I go in and I go and I've really realized, Oh, I see how this is a mileage shoe and this is a speed shoe because it's a lot more responsive. And there's like a purpose and a rhyme and a reason for why they make different types of shoes. Danielle, I guess you don't just put them on and just go running. (laughs) So, Same um, with tennis, though. People don't realize it. Everyone just puts it in tennis shoe and you're like, oh, there's a stability shoe. There's a speed. Yeah. So uh-huh. same, same. Yeah. And and I guess like this is this is this may be over the top for, for people who don't have different types of workouts. But um, for sure, as I, I was lucky enough that I was given many different types of shoes from Hoka and and for sure prioritizing certain shoes for certain runs have enhanced my running experience for mm. sure. Okay. Uh, it, it's like, it's like using the proper racket with the proper <laughs> string set of like, <laughs> that's a great analogy. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, yeah, when I, when I do my mileage runs, I do wear a shoe that has a little bit more height, like the Clifton nine. Um, it, that, I would say the Clifton Nine can last me anywhere between three hundred to four hundred miles. Okay. Um. So and and the tread you could also tell by like the tread on the bottom it's it's a little bit more durable. So I'll use like a Clifton Nine for a longer run because I'm going to put in more mileage and maybe speed is not a priority mm-hmm. and cushion is and the tread it and the you know the 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 tread at the bottom is. And then like when I go for a, a speed workout, I'll probably take out my Mach 5 or my Mach X or the Rocket X2 if I'm really, really feeling myself. Um, <laughs> but those shoes are so light, so responsive. I would say they last between 200 to 300 miles. Uh, so I'm mindful with how often I take those out. So more or less for speed work, not for not for mileage. Mm-hmm. And then you got your your walking shoe, like like your Bondi's or um, your Gaviotas, which have a lot of height. But for me personally, they are too much shoe to run with. Like I'm kind of running with like blocks on my feet. I can run, but for sure, like a Clifton or a or a Mach Five is a more enjoyable feel for me as as a runner. Um, so what are you racing in then? The Mach X, is it? Or the Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Mach X. Okay. I'm, I'm racing in the Mach X. And then what does a week of training look like for you right now? And uh, what are your favorite training runs? Uh so for me, I shoot anywhere between twenty five to to thirty five miles a week. A um a <laughs> <amount of> miles. <laughs> It's a decent um, amount, guys. <laughs> um, so Monday, Monday, I'll just probably do like a five mile run. Um, Tuesday, I'll do some hills. 
Wednesday, I'll I'll probably do like a recovery run from my hills, mm. and um, <laughs> and Thursday I'll do some speed, which can comprise of eight hundreds, four hundreds, or thousands. And Friday is probably my rest day from running. And Saturday would be my longer run, anywhere between 8 to 13 miles, depending on how many other runs I did in the week. Maybe if mm-hmm. I skipped one, I'll hit it. I'll hit 13. Nice. And Sunday, if I feel like it, I will go for a nice five-mile recovery. <laughs> so, yeah, that's anywhere between 25 five mile recovery. and 35. <laughs> And at the moment, I am prioritizing my speed. So I am putting more. So if I were to skip a workout, I would skip. Uh, I wouldn't skip one of those. Okay. Right? I wouldn't skip the hills and I wouldn't skip the speed workout on um, on Thursday. I do prioritize so, those. What's on the race agenda? You must be training for something. I am not, actually. No, I nice. do not have something on the agenda. I may run a half marathon for Hoka uh, in November, but I'm still trying to see if um, if that will if that will work out or if they need me to run it. Um, but as of right now, it's just fun to to maintain my fitness and um, yeah, I guess I am prioritizing my speed right now because I'm tired of seeing 820s on my <laughs> long run. <laughs> well, and then like I have so many questions, all the questions, because I, mm-hmm. yeah, um, I get it. But have you found a favorite distance? And is it, it seems like you're enjoying the half distance. Yeah, but- I don't think I am ready to do a full. Like I, and it's not because I can't, it's more or less, there's a lot of other factors that go go into it I think like the nutrition becomes a an a deal Mm -hmm. the hydration becomes a thing um if if I'm training for a half marathon it's um it's fairly I'm not saying it's easy it's it's manageable I don't Mm -hmm. need to plan um you know aid stations for myself during a training run Mm -hmm. I don't need to I don't need to pack a bar or I don't need to pack gels I can I can bust out 13 without a water break. Um, so it just makes the workouts a lot simpler. Mm-hmm. And um, so so that's like my main reason uh, for not training for a full right now. And, and yeah, that just, I, and I think it's also the recovery time to like going out and, running a full marathon and training for a full marathon it does something like to your body like where you need to actually not race for a while <laughs> before you hit another one. Oh, I, I mean I'm sure like the there are very high level runners that could race multiple marathons within a shorter pow- shorter um amount of recovery time than advised but that is not me um, <laughs> <laughs> but i can i can run a half marathon like anytime like like right, right? now let's go <laughs> <laughs> i can run a, i can bust out 13 this weekend if i wanted to take a weekend <laughs> off and if and if hoka wants me to run one the following weekend i could do that too like i <laughs> as i can maintain that fitness without doing in doing serious damage to my body just because the mileage is not too high. Um, and also, uh, I'm, I'm still on court and such. So I want to, I want to keep in mind the hours I am on court. Like that's, that's also, you know, that's standing and Mm -hmm. that's standing too. That's like, that's pressure on your legs. And, and by all means, I don't, I don't want to give anything less than a hundred percent to, to whatever I'm, to whatever I'm putting out for my students as well. Mm -hmm. So, so that's why like, no, no full marathon. (laughs) (laughs) And like, in the meantime, everyone's breaking records in the running world. So running is trending. Like, look at, look at these athletes. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy because I, I don't, I don't know if it's the shoe technology some might say, yeah, I, it might be the <laughs> it's those carbon plates, man. Mm-hmm. I didn't believe it before until I started wearing them. It's like I wore the rocket 
the rocket was the first my first carbon plated shoe i put them on and i was like oh my god i'm like on cheat mode <laughs> like it's you the, always the, say too like i want shoes that make me feel like i can be faster and it's like oh <laughs> yeah no like i'm running on these and i'm just like it's doing the running for me like <laughs> I'm I, I don't need to kick my leg back like it's just doing it for me that's an, amazing and that's wild and, yeah and you never you can you'd never know until you actually like experience it and you put your feet in there you put these rockets on and you're just like gosh they're like the weight of socks my socks are heavier <laughs> than these shoes and is running for me so there's nothing on my feet and it's doing it for me like what kind of sorcery is this is that right <laughs> well and to bring it back to tennis it'll be interesting to see because tennis has always kind of followed behind a little bit behind the running technology so like mm-hmm. we started seeing the super foams in running and then now we have them in tennis but the carbon plate th- there's actually a carbon plate in the coco shoe the new balance coco shoe oh wow so, oh, okay yeah but that shoe is like a little bit more built a little more sturdy so i went it's definitely not light um yeah. so it would be interesting to see how the tennis world does maybe take some of this technology from running and continue to innovate on the tennis side because no, i mean i don't know cool. if the game can get much faster in tennis but yeah i mean like i know that carbon plate can do wonders over a long period of time just because you don't need to propel yourself you know um but i wonder if like for short bursts how that translates i know i don't know yeah you know and, and I'm, I'm not talking about a hundred meter dash i'm talking no. about a 10 meter dash, right? the net. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> side to side <laughs> and back again yeah, well, yeah i mean if you if you think about it the track the premier track and field runners i don't do their do their spikes have carbon plates on it i should know this but i don't i should know this too i don't know they're so minimal I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're so minimal, right? Like, there's so, I don't know, just food for thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, mm-hmm. stay tuned. Running Warehouse is uh, launching a podcast, so maybe we can do a crossover okay. episode. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll bring them in. Yeah, um, that, I would like to request, like, a question. Does a carbon-plated, the, do, will a carbon-plated shoe benefit a tennis player? And that would be great <laughs> because our owner of running, Joe Rubio, who's like, I got this whole running background. I can't even begin to list everything. But he wants to have segments where Joe answers questions from the internet. So we will have you mm-hmm. submit a question. He will love it. Okay. He knows nothing about tennis, but <laughs> it will be fine. Um, let's see. Um, okay. What's your favorite running accessory aside from your shoes? I love like some of the running stuff. That doesn't cross over into tennis, I guess. I don't know. What's this? Next? And like, yeah, what are you running with? Do you have a run belt? What's the, what's the setup? Where do you put no, your keys? No. Okay. Where I, do you put your no phone? Running, what do you listen to? <laughs> no running belt. I tried one the other day. I felt like, eh, not for People me. People either I, like have to have them or hate them. Yeah, I I I wear these like um these spandex that have those really tight pockets Mm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. i like put my phone in there if i am gonna bring it a favorite running accessory would probably be my running watch (laughs) i knew you were gonna say that garmin my garmin like it's like my best friend like especially (laughs) when i'm doing repeats or like if i'm doing like speed workout it's my best friend but it is my worst enemy too it's like <laughs> beeping and telling me must go faster and i'm just like my legs can't go fast chill, like you're chill. not hitting the target <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh. but it's such a great um training tool like that garmin watch i just i wish i was more in tune with that in college and um i just started wearing garmin maybe like five six years ago so um and i and i was already doing some like speed and track workout when i came out of college and that would have helped so much just to see the the data instead of i i think i had I think I was wearing like a baby G back then or something <laughs> like that. And and just timing myself, self-timing myself, like doing this one, like <laughs> right right before um oh my gosh, right before right? like crossing, yeah. like yeah, right before crossing the line. I'm over here like trying to like find the button on my watch without losing my speed. Um but well, uh, now it's just funny because like once you're a runner and like you just see people at the stoplight and you just see this motion you're yeah, like yeah yeah, yeah. 
have you know. <laughs> yeah. So I use the gar I use my Garmin and other good accessories I've been using like uh the Polar Pacer Pro. It's another it's another watch. Uh, I I was doing some uh some projects with them as well and they're a little bit more like sport holistic approach like mm -hmm. they they have like a tennis function as well they're a lot more heart rate um heart rate uh monitor uh central i feel like in terms of like looking at hrv your recovery um sleep cycles are you fully recovered uh according to how much work you put in yesterday and such it really spells it out for you but in terms of like the actual like running and track workout and such garmin is still like my number one like nice. you say you can't beat it it's so good <laughs> <laughs> and there's so many different models too like mm -hmm. you can dive as deep as you want into being as geeked out as you want and then the app the app's also amazing no the, the garmin interface is the best it's the it's the best interface. I, I do think I need to upgrade my watch at some point though because I only my watch only draws off of one satellite. Um, um, which signal. one do you have? The Vivo like, Active. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I was gonna tell you. Of, oh, what were you saying? Oh, because I was referencing our ultra runner in our office. She has one of the most tricked out ones, and she loves it. Worth yeah. like worth it. Um, I think she has the one of the Phoenix Sevens, maybe. Mm, that that is very fancy. Yeah, she's. I mean, she's fancy, but she's like elevation, hundred k, all the crazies. Oof, oof, no, 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 no. <laughs> all I, the crazy. I just need my four hundred meter, my eight hundred meter, my thousand. And maybe nice. if it could connect to a Bluetooth, then like <laughs> Bluetooth heart rate monitor, if I really want to be geeky, that yeah. that's the extent. Yeah. I love that. Oh, and um, also, what else? also my sweat test, my biosensor. Oh, that's been how like did that? Cool, that's yeah. been a cool thing to check Tell out. Tell me about Ooh. that. What? How is your body holding or not holding in that liquid? How's your sweat? <laughs> Um, so I thought for sure that I sweat just as much I, or more in my indoor cycling as I do on my runs, but it's like, f it couldn't be further from the truth. I sweat you a sweat lot more. more in my outdoor runs. I exude a lot more electrolytes in my outdoor mm. runs. Um, so it, it's been cool to use the, the biosensor to to just now take it on different types of workouts and, and mm -hmm. see what happens i did do a pretty gnarly speed workout last thursday mm -hmm. and i i exuded more electrolytes on that day because of the intensity of the workout then oh uh, so crazy yeah then on the other then perhaps like my long like 13 mile run that was like a little bit more not slow but like steady right Right, but I was doing like thousand thousand meter repeats with four hundred meter repeats also, and like that day just knocked me on my butt, like, <laughs> and then knocked the biosensor, like knocked the biosensor <laughs> on my butt too. Like he's like it, I, I was like looking at the data. I was like, holy moly! No wonder I felt like I was on the verge of cramping. Like after the fourth, like one thousand, that was pretty ridiculous. Well, and I know you're connected with Salt Steak, but how do you replenish after a workout like that? Yeah, so like for me, like I'm really bad at this. I probably should be replenishing during that mm -hmm. workout actually. I had to. I was on my fourth 1000 and I was like my right my right calf is about to go. I no. must <laughs> go, I must take something. So so I took a, a salt I took two uh salt stick fast shoes mm -hmm. right there. Um and and of course, made it through the workout. Oh, thank you. Cuz <laughs> cuz I would have hated to have been started cramping on the other side of the park where I would have not made it where I would have had to crawl back. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but horrible. um in terms of like yeah replenishing i after you know what i would say a strong workout is like i would probably replenish around like 60 milligrams of like uh, electrolytes because that is the number that i see i lose okay that's cool on the biosensor per, okay. per hour i'm around like i depending on the day i'm I range between like 53 and like 64. 
kilograms per hour. And normally my, my runs and my workouts are around an hour. So like when I'm, okay. when I'm done, I'll, I'll put that back in. And if I'm trying to go for like super, super quality workout, like that day, like because I know I lose around like 50, 53 to 60 ish, mm-hmm. I will like preload with that much too. Nice. That's very smart. And of course, you're very dialed in. I That's the one thing that I can say is you're very intentional always. So I think I've said that before. Um, <laughs> where was I going, though? I had a good question. Oh, I wanted you to explain real quick to anyone listening that maybe has not really experienced running or started running or maybe like they've dabbled in it. But talk to me about when you increase your mileage and how important it is to not increase too much at a time and what did it look like when you kind of started this uh, more serious running journey yeah so i mean yes increasing mileage gradually is is such an important like concept like just because you ran 10 last week doesn't mean you can run run 12 this week or just because you ran six last week doesn't mean oh i let me push it to eight this week right um, yeah. what what i've learned in the running world is normally you'll go up and then down and then up again so like let's say you ran we'll put a lower number six this week maybe last week maybe mm-hmm. this week you'll go down to four and then the following week you'll you'll you can push it up to seven or eight, depending on like what other runs you you did. I'm I'm just talking about the long run. Mm-hmm. But um basically your body needs time to adapt to be able to take in that mileage. Um whatever and, and it another great way to think about it, this is not like completely like scientifically like I, I wish I had a better way to explain it, but whatever fitness like you acquired today doesn't show up until like a few weeks later, right? So just because like I ran six today doesn't mean like, woo, like Danielle, you have six in the bag. No, you have six. You just completed six, but you don't have six in the bag until a couple of weeks later. So that's why you don't bump, you don't continue to bump it up right? You know, every week because your body isn't ready for it even though you may have even though you ran a distance kind of close to what you're shooting what if you were to bump it up this week like let's say if I ran six last week and you'd go like oh I ran six last week eight is not that far from six no eight is very far from six because you're still (laughs) waiting for your fitness to arrive in the mail like (laughs) I like that he has to deliver it still like you must wait like or Uh, and like if you don't your body will tell you (laughs) yeah and if you don't your body will tell you and then you be and then you get to zero miles and then that's a whole nother like Mm -hmm. then you have to start the build all over again and so um, I wish I had a better way to explain it, but that's just like an explanation for, you know, as a tennis player, like an explanation for dummies, like from me. Um, but yes, I, I should probably work on uh, being more clear with that. But that's how I understand <laughs> it. <laughs> no, I just remember like when I kind of started my little running journey, mm-hmm. I would be like, "Ooh, I did this and now I can do this. And then like on a weekend, like, yay, let's do a long run. Let's see if we can do this. And then you like finish a long run and you had never gone that far before. And it was like maybe that two mile increase. And y- the rest of the day, you just feel like you've been hit by a bus and it's just like, oh, no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or yes. that's how I, I felt at least. <laughs> yes. Recovery runs and days off on your on your legs are are important and also i would recommend actually writing down and keeping track of how many miles you are putting in per week i like that too because if you're just if you just wake up and you're not really keeping track and you're like oh i feel like i could put this much in today then it just kind of gets lost in the abyss of like you know like if you're if you're running based off of like how you feel and your emotion that's that's a great way to get injured too because some days you just have enough caffeine and you're just like wow (laughs) I could hit eight today and it's not that you can hit eight it's because like your pre-workout was just feeling fantastic (laughs) today and and um you're just feeling more mentally feeling more more ready than what your body is ready for. So um, I would definitely keep track and and just Google it. Google how to build up your mileage. Like that's, there's a lot, a lot out there. And running GBT. warehouse. Go to yeah, and go to running warehouse to check it out. They have a bunch. Oh, yes. uh, <laughs> Great resource. Yes. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's wrap this up. Who are some of your current sponsors? You always have the coolest brand deals. <laughs> <laughs> Tennis Warehouse. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tennis Warehouse. 
I have a I have Hoka behind me. Um, I I have picky bars um, still behind me, and uh, and salt stick right now. So that's that's the that's a that's a solid group. I I right? love all my brands. I love <laughs> all my brands. That's good. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Um, and then what are you, let's. I, I know it's such a vague question, but like, what are we thinking for goals as the year wraps up? What is 2024 going to look like? Mm-hmm. Are you going to be jumping back on the court to compete? Are you going to be traveling with some of the Team Tita players as their coach? Or are you going to be jumping into a vacancy in the college scene? What what does it look like? So right now I'm just doing some coaches training with the Pete Brown program. So I'm trying to get that up and running. Nice. And um in terms of jumping back on tour, no plans for that yet. Uh, and other than my my project with Pete Brown, I am looking to see like where I could fit in to make the most impact on whether it's junior players, some college players transitioning, or maybe a blend of both. Mm-hmm. In a way, I'm I'm looking to see from a consulting standpoint, how I can fill the gaps here. Um, it's going to take, take some creativity, but I think, um, there's a need for something like this out there because a lot of players don't need something full time. They just need, and especially if budget is a, is a concern, they don't need something full time. They just need quality to, to, um, set them off. Or, or to send them off for for a good few weeks and you know quality to come back to when when they're training um danielle i genuinely mean this like i think i am seeing you happier today than i have seen you in the last year so i am so happy that you are doing the things that you're doing and like it seems like it's like really filling up your soul and like you needed this so i'm very proud of you for a taking the opportunity to like do something that fills you up, but also be, it can be scary to try new things. And, you know, like you are, you put yourself out there in such an amazing way and everything is coming back to you. And it it just looks so, it looks good on you. And I'm very happy and proud of you. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Like, I, I really appreciate that. Trust me. It was, it was not easy to take a, take a step back from the competition because it's, it was a part of my life for so long, but I was also I also understood that I was in a mental space at that time where I wasn't going to achieve the goals that I had set out, and that perhaps maybe it was a it was a good time to experience the game in a different capacity. And and honestly, I'm I'm really glad I I've done it because it's brought me some other stuff. Too. Yeah, it's brought me some other things that have been really rewarding. And and yeah, that I'm. I'm taking it day by day, Perfect. and and the and the greatest part is like I feel like I'm I'm helping people, and still involved with you know the sport that I really love. So I'm I can't complain right now. I totally get it, and it's awesome. Um, where can people follow along with your journeys? Uh, on Instagram, the little <laughs> giant. Uh, you will see some some very some very funny videos or if they're if they're not funny to you you could just make fun of me <laughs> yes but um I I do my best just to entertain keep it light maybe educate a little bit but um I have I have some cool content in store yes stay tuned yes okay we're so excited I love that you're what you're doing and very proud of you thank you for joining me and we'll talk again soon yes yes thanks Awesome. Yay.